Okay, we're going to have a message. We're going to finish up uh, this morning in the book of Titus in chapter 3. And uh, I'll read uh, with us together. Perhaps we could stand for a moment. I'm reading from the NIV, which is different from the ones in your pews, but you can listen or follow in your Bibles as you wish. Paul writing to Titus. And he says, Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility towards all men. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating others. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Oh, Father, once again, we're just uh, thankful for this time, this moment, this appointed time for us to be gathered together this morning with your word open, with your, your presence with us today, that you will quicken and speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's be seated together. <clears throat> we remember we were in a series in Titus and we're now in chapter 3. Our theme being uh, a house in order with sound doctrine and godly living. And godliness or goodness or good works is a theme that actually goes through uh, this book. In chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Teach the older women to teach what is good. In 2.5, it says the younger women that would do what is good. In 2.7, it says that Titus was to be an example himself of good works. In 3.1, we just read, Remind the people to be ready to do which, that which is good. 3.8, that the people would be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. And 3.14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing good or to maintain good works. We understand that good works are not for salvation, but good works are the result of salvation. Good works are not the condition to get something, but they are the fruit of having something. For when Christ came into our life, when the grace of God embraced our life, there was a change that took place. And and that is by by the grace of God, to the glory of God. And Paul makes that crystal clear. In fact, we remember back in 2.11, after listing certain qualities that, that are to be seen in the church among the older women and the younger women and the older men and the younger men, etc., all the people in the church, he then says, for the grace of God has appeared. So he says these expectations or qualities would be seen in the church. Why? Because of the grace of God that has appeared that offers salvation to all. There's a similar phrase that we just read in 3.4, which says when the kindness and love of God, of God our Savior has appeared. So through Christ, grace has appeared, kindness has appeared, love has appeared. Through the gospel, that has changed our lives. The same principle we see in the book of Timothy. I'll read to you in 2 Timothy 1.9. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our what? Works. Not according to our good works, he has saved us, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus. So we are not saved by works. We are saved by grace. Nevertheless, grace, resident and effective in someone's life, bears fruit unto godliness. 
this salvation brings a transformation. In fact, in verse 12 there it says, grace teaches us to say no or to deny ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly in this present age. So grace is a, not just a concept or a doctrine or a theology. Grace is our teacher. Grace teaches us. And it teaches us to do what? It teaches us to deny one thing and to live in another. It teaches us, and we would say more than that, it, it enables us, it leads us, it has the effect in our life that we deny ungodliness and worldly passions and we live self-controlled, upright in this world. Not perfect lives, we still stumble and we fail and, and we sin. For we are sinners. It is our nature. But sin no longer has dominion over us if we are living under grace. In Romans 6.14. So some people say, oh, if you teach that it is all by grace, then people will use grace as a license to sin. But this verse clearly teaches that, that grace does not teach me to sin. But grace teaches me to deny ungodliness. And and that is while we are waiting for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So he has appeared, that's his first coming, and he will appear, that's the second coming. And now we live our lives between these two appearances or epiphanies of Christ. And what are we doing while we are waiting? But we are living godly lives to the glory of Of God. But He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own, eager to do good. So I had to use chapter 2 to lead us again into chapter 3, where the emphasis is on now He looks to the church body and He the emphasis here is is the conduct. We could use words like behavior or goodness or godliness or fruit. The emphasis is on goodness. And again, to emphasize a goodness that comes by grace, not through the efforts of our own flesh. And it makes sense, doesn't it? When you see a tree, if that tree is receiving life, it will bear fruit. And so it is with the Christian, that we are receiving life that the Spirit of God is in us and He is bearing fruit through us. But the most important issue is what is happening in the root system, under the ground, that that tree is receiving life and so it is with the Christian. If we are filled and we are feeding and we are growing, there will be fruit that is seen in our life. Unfortunately, the natural man looks at the tree and sees the fruit and makes the fruit the condition when actually the fruit is the fruit of something else, something under the ground, something beautiful and mystical and spiritual that is happening in a Christian's life. So someone might look at a Christian and say, oh, okay, that's what a Christian is. What is it that the Christian does and what is it the Christian doesn't do? Oh, he does this. He goes to church, he reads his Bible, he prays, and he doesn't do this. He doesn't swear and mock and slander and smoke. So if I do these and I don't do these, that makes me a Christian. And we say, no, no, no. Those things are just the fruits of something much deeper. And if you try and imitate the fruit externally without the life internally, you are just a religious moral man. And you miss the gospel. For it is God in us. It is Christ in us. So... James 2.18 says, You may say you have faith, but I will show you my faith by my works. The change that takes place is by His grace. So we need the Spirit and the Word, which is why we gather together, to quicken us again and again, to lead us back to this simple but powerful and central truth. And then Paul, given an an example of what it would mean for a Christian to be good in this world, and this leads us into chapter 3, he speaks about how to live as a citizen. 
says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Of course, the context here is for the Cretans under the Roman government, and the Cretans were very corrupt, and they would steal, and they would just try and get by and beat the system. Nevertheless, the principle, of course, is, is relevant for, for all Christians in all places and all times. We all need that reminding, that guidance, that encouragement. And this principle here, remind the people, it's not just all to jog their memory, but it's that they would be or we would be stirred up afresh in the faith. That we are jolted out of just being listeners to to being those that apply the word of God in our daily lives. And it would be seen in our lives, in our words, in our attitudes that people would see us or know us in a local community like ours and know that there is something certainly different. Subject to the rulers and the authorities, living according to the rules of the land. It may be common practice in the world, not with all men. There are certainly non-Christian men who are honourable and upstanding and abide by the law, of course. Equally, there are some Christians that don't, of course. But what what Paul is saying here is that if a Christian is living according to the biblical conviction, he will will, uh, be subject to the rules and authorities. And it may be common practice to try and and, uh, beat the system, but the Christian says, if I honor God, he will honor me. Not sidestepping the law, but being honest and doing it unto the Lord. To be obedient and ready to do whatever is good. So this is again is an echoing theme about doing good. But we almost, I almost feel like we need to, every time we say that, connect that to the grace of God. Because we quickly lose sight of that. It's not something that God is looking for us to produce or to live up to. But it's something that we are to live in. So, to be known in the community. And what's amazing about this little, local, imperfect, but blessed church is that we are known in the community, that people know us. You only have to talk to some of the mums and tots and hear what they have seen in their history about people that have served them. And maybe they they go to other places, but they say, oh, this team, these people, they see something um, that is beautiful there. And it says in verse 2, Slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and always to be gentle towards everyone. And this word slandering, to speak evil of no man. Again, this is something, if you remember, for some it was a longer time ago than others, but we all are living in the world, working in the world. We all have families. We all know what it's like, how quick people are to to bring someone down with their tongue, to slander someone behind their back. And here it says the Christian is not to do that, not to speak evil. It says of anyone, speak evil of no man. What an incredible thing that will be found in a person's life. But that is not the natural thing to do, but that is a spiritual fruit in our life. And then it says to be peaceable, the Greek word is, is the negation of to be a fighter or a brawler. Here is the Greek word to be a brawler, and it has the a prefix. So like theist and atheist, you have the word ma, ma, maxo, and then you have a maxo. It means not to be a fighter or to be peaceable. Not always ready to defend and justify and argue, but to be peaceable. Not always about being right but want to know, want to bring peace. And to be considerate, the word eparikis, it means there's a spirit of consideration or a sweet reasonableness. This is on the tales of not being a fighter, but being considerate, that you are a reasonable person, that even if someone has different convictions and beliefs to you, that's fine. You don't need to get in a fight over it. You are reasonable, you are peaceable, you are considerate. People in the world might live like people in the world. We understand that. 
And they may even visit our church and use certain language and certain expressions or take the Lord's name in vain. We understand that. They are not Christians. I'm not going to enforce my, my convictions on them when they are not Christians and they don't know grace. And It's different. There is grace and consideration towards them. It says always to be gentle towards everyone. And this Greek word involves meekness and humility in a relationship towards people. And then in verse 3, notice what he says. So he says, we don't slander, we are peaceable, we are considerate, we are gentle to all. Why? And look what he says in verse 3. Because at one time we too were foolish and disobedient and deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, etc. It's another way of saying, there go I, but by the grace of God. I am exactly the same as any other person or any other sinner on this planet, except grace has found my life and grace has affected my life. And I have nothing to boast in my flesh. God gets the glory. That God has done a work. So we don't look at society with contempt, but we look at society with compassion. You see the difference? Why does that person? No, we have a heart of compassion. We understand why that person. So each characteristic that's listed here interestingly, contrasts with one that was mentioned earlier in our studies of Titus. It says, they had been foolish, not sensible, which was mentioned earlier. They had been disobedient, not submissive, which was mentioned earlier as a Christian character. They had been deceived, not enlightened. They had been enslaved and not self-disciplined. They had been malicious and not peaceable. They had been envious, not considerate. They had been hateful and not loving. They had been, and at one time we too were, but something has happened in our life. That's what he's saying. So at one time we too, he looks back to the life, we could say B.C., if you like, before Christ. You may remember in your life when you weren't subject to the rulers. You say, no, no, no. Well, some of us may remember that. I remember that. You were foolish and disobedient and deceived. Some of you may remember that. You may remember hating people or being hated by people, maybe not. Maybe you were already ready for sainthood before you became a Christian. But most of us remember. And it wasn't just the Cretans, by the way. Notice Paul says, at one time, we too. Paul includes himself in that. We must remember what we were. Imagine if a starving pauper, a a homeless man starving and in such need. He's invited, uh, maybe that's you. Imagine you are a starving, homeless pauper on the streets and you're invited to the king's palace, let's say. And they they clean you and they clothe you and they give you an honored position in in the house and you are able to be among the servants and serve in the house. And now you have a life. You're fed every day. You live in the palace. You have your own room with silk sheets. and Oh, what a change. And then one day there's a knock at the door and you're sent to answer it. And there is a poor, starving, homeless person who's been invited to the palace. How do you treat them? May we never forget what grace has done in our life. May we be people of compassion. And may I rejoice in the fact, oh, look, I'm so thankful for you. Oh, if you knew what was happening ahead of you, oh, I rejoice for you. Because this is a house of grace. It was John Newton, the Christian who once was uh, on the slave ships, who on his deathbed, after preaching the grace that saved him for many years, said, I was young, and now I'm old, and my mind fails me, but two things I remember. I'm a great sinner, and Jesus is a great saviour. 
There's the phrase, you were bondmen in Egypt, you were slaves in Egypt. It echoes through the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 15, 15. And you shall remember that you were a bondman in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God has redeemed you. Also 16, 12. And you shall remember 24, 18. And you shall remember 24, 22. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. But God has redeemed you and brought you out. That reflection, that memory bringing thankfulness and praise in our life is important. In the language of Paul in the book of Ephesians, I'll read you the verses. We've only have Titus verses on the screen. But Ephesians 2.2 says, You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved, he says. And there's a similar phrase right here in verse 4 in our text this morning. It says, but when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us. You see that? It's very similar. You were dead in our sins, all but the love of God. At one time we too, but when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour appeared, look at these words, he saved us. Oh, glorious words. Oh, I want to hit the pause button and stay there a while. He saved us. Wow, that is our song. That is our praise. That is our message. That he saved us. Notice when the kindness and the love of God. The word kindness here is... is, um, Goodness or an excellence in the expression of heart. And love, interestingly enough, is not the word agape. It's the word philanthropos. Does that ring any bells? Philanthropy. Where one has the means and with an expression of compassion would meet the needs of one who doesn't have the means. That's the word here. That God's philanthropos Expression of love and compassion to meet the need of those who could never meet their needs. It's a benevolence and an immense kindness to meet the needs of another. Some translations say the goodness and the loving kindness. That's a good translation for this. All the goodness and the loving kindness of God. It's amazing that we can say this, sing this and know this. This morning, not just that he will save us, but he has saved us. Now on to verse 5. He saved us, but on what basis? Not because of righteous things that we have done. If our salvation was based on righteous things that we would do, we would never go to heaven. You say, well, no, I, I think I, I, there are good things that we do in our life. Yes, but the good things we do don't cancel out the bad things. It makes very common sense. Although some religions have the idea like this, that if your good works outweigh your bad works, then you're okay, you're going to get across the line. It doesn't make sense even in our own law courts. For if I am a good man, and yet I break the law, I pay the penalty. I don't say, oh, I know, but it's just this one time. Look at the good life I've led. I'm sorry, you broke the law. And in the same way, our good works, our good right, our works of righteousness cannot cancel out or pay for our sin. Which was why it was necessitated that God would become incarnate and go to the cross and take our place, that he would pay the price that we could never pay. I was in a gathering recently and we shared about Ephesians 2, verse 8, that you are saved by grace, and then it says, through faith, not of your works. And one lady said, oh, I have never heard that before. It's a, a 
sweet Irish Catholic lady. She said, I've never heard that before, that you are not saved by works, but you are saved by grace. And I said, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. It's so clear, yet so profound. He saved us, in that same verse, through the washing of the rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Of course, that was corporately at Pentecost, but then personally and individually for each one at the moment of faith in Christ. We were regenerated. We, we were renewed. So that, verse 7, No, doesn't want to do that. There you go. So that, having been, listen to these words, justified by his grace. Now, justified is a legal term that Paul uses. You could use the word salvation in there, but it's a specific element of salvation. Salvation covers many things, but justification is that you have been declared righteous in the eyes of God. If there was a law court and you were on trial, God says, I declare that man innocent or righteous. And this is the word that we have been, we have been made, we have been justified, made right in the eyes of God by grace. The free gift of God. We might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And then in verse 8 it says this is a trustworthy saying. And here he's looking back over the verses he just mentioned. Verse 4, 5, 6 and 7. These glorious, sublime truths. These high truths of the gospel. That grace appeared. Love and kindness appeared. And we have been saved by grace. We have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. And then he says, this is a trustworthy saying. Or this is a a, a saying that is worthy of our trust. It is a saying that is faithful. Worthy to be declared from the rooftops. And to be treasured in our hearts every day. It is the gospel. Then he says, I want you to stress these things. Isn't that great? I want you to stress these things. Or another translation could say it this way. I want you to constantly affirm these things. Or this is a a faithful saying, an incredible saying. It is the elements of the gospel. Oh, that every man would hear it. That every man would find it in their life. This is a trustworthy saying. And old Titus, I want you to stress it. I want you to constantly affirm it. In every message that you preach, and every meeting that you have, may the gospel be centered. Whatever the theme, whatever the passage, whatever the message, may the gospel be found there. I want you to constantly affirm and to stress these things. Why would we stress these things? He goes on. So that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. The word good, kalos. It means beautiful, valuable, profitable. Timothy, I want you to stress the gospel again and again and again so that those who have believed will continuously devote themselves to to good works in light of the grace that is in their lives. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. These things that you are to stress, Titus, these crucial tenets of the gospel, these high truths of grace, are excellent and profitable for everyone. Now notice this. So he tells Titus what he is to stress and what is profitable. And this is in contrast, verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Stress this, Timothy. Stray right here. This is your zone. This is the gospel. Stay right here. Don't be distracted and pulled away into quarrels and arguments about these secondary doctrines and this little issue over here. 
Of course, there's a time to talk about those, and we love questions and answers, and we love to think about and talk about all elements of theology. We'll take any question and we'll wrestle it together according to the scriptures. But don't allow it to pull you from the center. And sadly, in ministries and pulpits and in the lives of many Christians, they get pulled from the center. This reminded me of a verse in Hebrews 13. I remember seeing this Greek word a few years ago, Hebrews 13, 9, I read you the verse. It says, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. And the Greek word carried about is peripheral. It's where we get the word periphery. Do not be carried about from the center to the edge with secondary or strange doctrines. But it is good for the heart to be established in grace. Not with foods and dietary laws, etc., that have not profited. There's that principle again. This is not profitable. Has not profited those who have been occupied with them. And the Greek word occupied here is peripatio. You know what a patio is. Peri is to walk. And patio is you walk about on the patio. It's not a path going from one place to another. You walk about. And that's what the Greek word means. It means you walk about everywhere. You're walking on your patio. Peripatio. You are occupied with this. Or what about this question and this question and this question? Before you know it, you've left the center. But it's good for the heart to be established in grace and not to be carried about by these other doctrines. You get the balance. Of course, they're good questions and we want to talk about them. And let's do that. But not at the expense of losing our focus. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, don't lose your way. You're going to have people, particularly in that culture and time, uh, from those from the circumcision and Jews that were trying to bring questions about the law and the Sabbath and genealogies and things like that. Paul was saying to Timothy, the gospel... That is the focus. That is the message. So avoid foolish controversies, searching questions or disputes. And genealogies, of course, again, important in the Bible. But don't lose your focus. They are unprofitable. And then he says in verse 10, warn a divisive person, and there's a connection here, those that would make that their focus and want to make an issue on those questions and doctrines and issues, warn those people. Warn them once and warn them a second time and after that have nothing to do with them. This word divisive, in verse 10, warn a divisive person, is the Greek word heretikos. It's where we get the word heresy. One who is teaching other than the central gospel of who Christ is and what he has done. The word means to be schismatic, to bring division. This person may have questions, but they're not asking questions because they really want to learn. They're asking questions because they want to justify their position and cause division in the church. That's different. And often you recognize that someone has a question. You soon know if they want to really know the answer or they, they just want to try and catch you out. So he's saying these Hereticos, these, those who would cause division, warn them. And this word is to call them to attention, to gently show them the error of what they're doing and the consequences of it. You realize, gosh, I understand you've got that issue and you believe that way, but you understand it's going to cause division in the church and there's new believers and we don't really believe that way. So you're welcome to stay, but please, you know, can you be... Warn them once and then warn them a second time. And then after that, have nothing to do with them or shun them or reject them. And it may be that that person needs to have some clear definition for the sake and the health of the body. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. And often people causing division have an unresolved guilt in their life. They are living in some measure of self-condemnation. And then the closing verses... As he closes the letter, he said, I will send Artemis or Tychicus to you. Do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to winter there. So Paul says, listen, I want you to come to me, but first I will send someone to cover the church in your absence. 
And there are a few, four people mentioned in these last verses. Two of them we know, they're mentioned elsewhere, and two are not known. But still all are so valuable. So much of the work of the ministry is done by people that perhaps we don't see or don't know their names. They're not recorded in a missionary biography anywhere. Nevertheless, the work was desperately dependent on their portion. And he says in verse 13, do everything you can to help. These are the other two, Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that you can do everything they need. And he connects this request to the theme that runs through the letter. Do everything you can to help them. And then verse 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. So he connects that request. Oh, these guys, can you help them out on their way? And again, this is an expression of goodness in the life of a believer. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity to go through this passage together, to consider the fruit of your great grace in our lives, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Oh, we thank you. We give you the glory for the journey that we're on, that we are all growing in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. And none of us have attained, but we are on a journey with you. We thank you for your daily work, for the voice of your spirit, the the rhemas of your word, the encouragement of the body of Christ, and all that you use in our life to equip us and lead us in our walk with you. We do pray, according to this study, that you would help us, that there will be fruit that would be born in our lives, that would be evident to us and to all around us, that we would know that that is by your grace. Perhaps there's someone here this morning visiting or someone listening online. You're not sure of your salvation. Oh, the gospel is so, so simple, so beautiful that God loves you, that Jesus died for you, that there is a free gift that is offered to you in him, a gift of life, eternal life, abundant life. And in your heart, just say, Oh, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I trust you. I believe you, that you are the Savior and you died for me. Thank you for saving me by your grace through faith. Oh, reveal yourself to me and help me on my journey of faith, I pray in Jesus' name. And for each one here, we pray these words would encourage us in our hearts and our walk with you. And the days ahead, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.